Yes, good morning. Um, why am I not seeing my notes here? There we go. All right, I'm very excited to be here. Um, a couple weeks ago, I went to Ruby on Ales, and I got a cold, and I think I got it from Mike. Yes. Um, so I think that this conference is Ruby for what ails you, <laughs> which is a cold. Uh, my name is Aaron Patterson. You can find me on the internet as Tenderlove. I am on the Ruby core team, and I am also on the Rails core team. It doesn't mean that I know what I'm talking about. It just means that I'm really bad at saying no. <laughs> So, anyway, um, I'm really, really excited to be here. I'm actually from Utah. I am from Utah. I grew up here in Salt Lake City. Um, and people always ask me the same question when they find out that I'm from Utah. And I just want to, like, preface everybody and answer it up front. The answer is no. Um, I don't know how to ski. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I grew up in Rose Park, but I moved to Seattle about 14 years ago, so don't ask me for any food recommendations. But uh, I want to see how many of you uh, live here in Utah now? Okay. And how many of you are from out of town? Okay, so about half and half. All right, so half of you are going to know, know this stuff already. I'm going to talk about some Utah stuff. So this is the Utah State cooking pot. It is a Dutch oven. <laughs> I don't know why we did this. I remember we did this back in 1997. I was still living here, and there was a hubbub because people were like, why aren't you passing some real laws instead of talking about cooking pots? Anyway, cooking pot. I love my Dutch oven. Um, you should check out Stonecutter because apparently they have scones here that are different from anywhere else. I've never been to Stonecutter. But you should go to Crown Burger because they have pastrami sandwiches that are super good, right? Right? Um, the state snack is green jello. This is true. This is totally true. So if you go somewhere and order some food, try to get green jello. And for bonus, like authenticity points, it will have carrots in it. <laughs> totally serious. Uh, also, you should get fry sauce. This is a like Utah thing. It's like fry sauce. You dip fries in it. I guarantee you, anywhere you go to eat, like if they have fries, ask for fry sauce. They will have it. I'm serious. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, the last thing I want to talk about for these Utah stuff for people who have not been here before is a little bit of weird stuff. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> this is the weird stuff. That was, that was like... <laughs> uh, we, have, we have a pyramid. Um, Google that word. You'll find interesting things. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to cover it, but you can find that online. Um, also, there is this Sphinx. This is a Sphinx of Joseph Smith. You should go check this out. It is. It is. It really is. There is a, there is a park called Gilgal Park. It's actually very close to here. You can probably walk. I'd say it's within walking distance. Um, go check this out. There's a bunch of like stonework and stuff there. It used to be closed off to the public. This whole park was closed off to the public. It was privately owned property. Uh, when I was going to high school here, I would sneak into this park and take pictures. I've been kicked out of this park many times. <laughs> However, uh, they were so uh, the people who owned it were going to sell it and they were going to build build houses on this place. But they said like you know. Everybody was like, no, we don't want you to do that. So the city actually bought it and turned it into an actual park so you can go there without sneaking in. It's a public park. So anyway, yes, you should check this out. Uh, and I brought two very special guests with me today, my parents. So nobody embarrass me. They're down here. So I invited them, I invited them because I would like them to see what I do. <laughs> Like, I don't actually, I'm not, I'm not sure that they believe that I actually draw a paycheck, <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, like, obviously I've been living on my own for quite a while and I have to be getting money from somewhere, but I would like them to know that I'm not like, you know, getting money from loan sharks or whatever my entire life. So I thought I would invite them to see, you know, so they could see what I actually do for a living. Uh, unfortunately, this, this talk has absolutely nothing to do with my job. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, hopefully, hopefully we'll do we'll do something. They they taught me they taught me a very important lesson that was if you learn stuff, uh, you can do things. So uh, if you look at my if you look at my grades from school, you will notice that I didn't learn this lesson for quite a long time. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, the usefulness of the stock is about zero. So uh, we might discuss some rele relevant stuff. But all right, let's get into it. Uh, this talk is called Oh, Ho, Ho, It's Magic, You Know. <laughs> I'm going to talk a lot about Magic the Gathering. Um, yeah, yes, I play Magic the Gathering. Anyone else here play? Anyone? A few people? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, so recently I started playing again. I'll talk about, all right, Magic the Gathering, for people you don't know is a who don't know, is a collectible card game. It's a, it's just, it's a card game, and you can collect, car collect the cards and play against people and stuff. Uh, and I played this. I played this game about 10 years ago, and uh, I bought a whole bunch of cards, and I was having a good time, then I went to a tournament and got destroyed by a 13-year-old, and he like slapped me in the face and insulted my, insulted my parents, so I quit. <laughs> I was like, it was basically like playing Call of Duty, except in real life, it was just, it was extremely <laughs> terrible, so I just quit. And then, um, Anyway, so recently, like somebody, a friend of mine was like, hey, do you want to play? I'm sorry to play Magic the Gathering. You want to play? And I was like, yeah, I've got like thousands of cards in my closet. I'd love to play. So I pulled the cards out and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I literally have thousands of cards, like five or 6,000 cards. And I don't know what I have. So I was looking at all these cards and I'm like, I was thinking to myself, well, what do I have? And is it any good? And how much is it worth? Like, what, these are the things I wanted to know about these cards. And I had thousands of these, and I didn't want to figure it all out. Like, this seemed like a job for computers. So like, this seemed like a repetitive task, exactly something that computers should be able to do. So I put on my robe and wizard hat, and I put together a system to identify these magic cards. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is how, I identified these, how I'm identifying these things using a computer, so it's hopefully less work, though you'll see it's actually more work. <laughs> but that's not what's important. The important part is the journey, right? <laughs> it's the journey. <laughs> anyway, so we'll talk about my hardware. The hardware I have is basically a laptop and a webcam and this, this box here that's totally washed out, but I've got a little bo a light box there with a, with a light on top of it, and the webcam points into the box, so it's just pointing down like that, and it sees in there, it looks like that, that's what it sees, so I've got a card in there. And here's a demo of the, demo of the final system. Like, basically, up here on the right is my uh, webcam view, like it's a live stream from my webcam. Up there in the upper left, that is the program working, it's identifying the cards. So it shows me what it thinks is the right card, and I say, like, yes, that's the right one, and it saves it. You can see in the terminal, like, I get more, there's values being shown there at the bottom. That's when the card gets saved. So it's showing me that stuff. All right, so I say, it says save that. Like, good job. You saved the card, so I keep going. And this is what I do. So I put the card in, the computer's like, okay, good job. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> anyway. So our high-level process is basically we have a machine that takes a photo, it takes a photo of the card, and then it tries to extract the card from that photo, then it tries to identify the card, and then save the data, and then we just repeat this loop over and over and over again, right? So I kind of glossed over card identification. We're going to go into that a little bit more detail. Basically, we start out, I start out with a corpus of data. Like, I have a whole bunch of images that I know are good. I know that these particular images match up with this particular data, right? I have some image card, I have some picture of a card, and I know that that card goes with that data in text, right? So the program will take a guess using this corpus. It gets the image, takes a guess, and then it prompts me and says, hey, Aaron, am I right? I think it's this card. Like, I think it's one of these. I'm pretty confident it's this one. Am I correct? And I say, like, yes, good job, or no, this is the actual answer. And then we repeat this loop, but it learns. Every time I teach it, it saves that data so that hopefully the next time we go through this loop, it gets smarter. So it has a larger corpus to search from. The actual system parts, like the actual code that's involved here, I have... I use this uh, libp hash for doing card matching, OpenCV for recognition and cropping, and then SQLite 3 for actually uh, storing the data. Um, and I'm going to go over each of those parts. Um, so information gathering is concerned. Get it? Gathering. <laughs> so I'll talk about how I gather the information. Basically, I got it all from uh, Wizards of the Coast website, which 
what I did is we have a, pay, a web page that looks like this, and what I have to grab from it is I need to get, like, well, I need the name of the card, uh, I need to get the image because I have to do matches against that. I get the set. The reason I get the set is because a particular card can be reissued multiple years. However, uh, the particular year in which it was issued impacts the price, so I want to know what, I, like, I want to know how much it's worth, so I need to know the set. Uh, and then I don't know if the cards are any good, so I choose, I also save the rating. Anyway, so thinking about this, like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to model this data. We have a card image. It's like we got an image, we got a card. So obviously our relationship here is an image has one card and a card has one image. Totally makes sense, right? So I get all my program written, and then all of a sudden I find out, nope, you're wrong. There is one image. This, is, this here is one image, but it has two cards on it. And, you know, everybody, everybody here who's ever written a web application knows when your data changes, you're like, oh, it sucks. It sucks super hard. So anyway, this happened. I'm like, okay, I'll fix it. I fix it, all right. An image has many cards. Card has one image. We're good to go. So I rerun my program. It crashes again because of this stupid card, which is <laughs> two images that belongs to one card. <laughs> So then I have to change my data again. So we're like, okay, we, image hasn't belonged to many cards. Hard, card has, hasn't belonged to many images. Okay, great. So technology I use, I want to talk about how I actually downloaded this data. So we're going to talk about how I actually scraped this website and got the data. And I used promises in Ruby. Does anybody, did anyone know that we have promises in Ruby? We do, yes. Does everyone know what a promise is? I will talk about what a promise is. is a promise is something I say like, hey, I want you to execute this code. Like, I got a chunk of code here. I need you to perform this particular calculation. Uh, I don't care when you do it. Like, I want you to do it at some point in the future. Later on, I'm going to ask you for the value, right? It's basically, think of it as, I promise to do this work at some point. So here's what our, in Ruby, here's what our promise API looks like. We say, like, OK, here's, we give it a chunk of work, and we can ask the promise for its status. Uh, we can call the value method. The value method will give us the re resulting value of the computation, but it will block until the computation finishes. So in this particular case, when I call value, it might, s it might sit there for five seconds until it calculates 10 times 25. Uh, we can ask whether or not the promise is alive, and we can actually cancel promises too. So this entire implementation, let me show you the entire implementation of the promise system in Ruby. This is it. That is the entire implementation. Uh, the only downside about this is that you can have too many promises. You can make an unlimited number of promises in Ruby, and we don't really want that. When we think about these promises as threads, it doesn't really make sense because maybe we can't execute that much stuff in parallel. Like, if you only have four CPUs, does it make sense to make a million promises? Maybe not. So what I needed to do is I needed to limit my promises. So what's really cool in Ruby is we can actually limit the number of promises we have. And the way I did it was with this executor pool, which is basically just a thread pool. It lets me run n or size, size promises in parallel. Unfortunately, it makes our promise implementation look a little bit harder. This is what the promise code looks like. And what it does is we have an executor thread which actually executes the block of code. Our main thread says, like, hey, give me the value, but it sits there until the executor thread says, OK, I'm done, releases it, and then the main thread can actually get the value. What, let, what this lets me do is it lets me queue up a bunch of work, and I say, OK, I want you to queue up, queue up some work, go grab some data from Wizards of the Coast to process it, and then I want the value a little bit later. And I, needed to, I wanted to limit this to five connections. So I was only making five simultaneous connections to Wizards of the Coast. So this is basically me in action shot, like, ah, yeah, five connections. Look at that parallel. It's so amazing. So I downloaded, like, I downloaded all this data in parallel with this code, and I ended up with 1.6 gigabytes of data on my hard drive, which was really awesome. I was able to download 1.6 gigs in about, like, I think... 40 minutes or so. So I was like, oh, I wonder if they've noticed me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so after doing all this work, all this work, I come to find out about this amazing website called mtgjson.com, which is, <laughs> which is literally all of that data in JSON format. <laughs> All of that data in JSON format. So the moral of this story is try Google first. <laughs> you could save a lot of time. But remember, it's the journey, right? It's the journey. <laughs> so 
Anyway, anyway, the next thing I use is uh, perceptual hashing. So I need to be able to identify these images, like make sure that they're the same. Like I took a picture, I got a card, I need to make sure, match it up with the cards we have in the system. So I do that with perceptual hashing. And the way this works is I have two images. So on the left there is my reference image, and on the right is my scanned image. And what the perceptual hash does is it calculates a key for a particular image. And down there at the bottom, those are the keys for these two, these two images. It's just like, think of it just like you would think of a hash key, hash key algorithm, like calculating a key for a particular thing, right? So what I do with these is I say like, okay, I need to figure out how far apart they are, and this, this particular library, given two hash keys, I can calculate the distance from each other, what is called the Hamming distance. So it will tell me how similar these two images are, and this is the code, this is what the code looks like. So we can see like, okay, I've generated a hash for A and B, and then I get the Hamming distance between the two, and the Hamming distance is eight. So we don't really know what that means, except that if we look at another card, like these two cards look totally different, we get two values for them, and we see in this case the Hamming distance is 28. So the lower the Hamming distance, the closer the images are together. So the next thing I need to do with this is I need to be able to sort this data. I have like, um, Wizards has produced, I think, about 25,000 cards, 25,000 unique cards. So I need to be able to calculate this Hamming distance against 25,000 unique cards and get the top, you know, three or four or whatever. And I actually do this in the database. What I did is I extended SQLite 3 to add a Hamming distance function, which actually calls out to this libp hash, calculates the Hamming distance inside of the database, and then I can sort by Hamming distance in ascending order so that this doesn't actually have to re-enter Ruby. I can say like, hey, database, figure out everything for me, and it does. So the next thing I did is I had to calculate hashes for the entire corpus. I downloaded all these images. I need to figure out what all their hashes are and then store them in the database so I could sort. And the way I did this was with this not actual code. Just queued up all these. I have four CPUs. I want to do this all in parallel. So I've got four CPUs. I need to calculate these. And calculating hashes took a very long time. It took about, I don't know, maybe an hour or so to do all 26,000 26, hashes in advance. And what sucked is I was doing this. I had four CPUs, and I see this. It's like it's using one CPU. I'm super annoyed by this. But what I discovered is like all this all this computation that's going on is completely, it's completely in C. So it's just, uh, it doesn't have to re-enter the Ruby, Ruby runtime. It's all written in C, and what that means is you can actually release Ruby's, uh, Ruby's gil around that C code. You can say like, hey, I want you to unlock here and perform some calculation and then reacquire after you get done. And what that means is we can actually execute CPU intensive code in parallel. So I patched the library and sent them a patch for this so that it would unlock the GVL around doing, calculating those hashes. And after that, now I have, I'm using all four CPUs to calculate hashes for my entire corpus. And I was like, yeah, threads. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the next thing is recognition and cropping. And this is the part where I get like kind of, I don't know, a bit cargo culty. So for those of you that don't know, uh, cargo culting is basically like, you're not sure exactly how this works, you just like write down the incantations and things seem to happen. And the reason is because I'm using OpenCV. OpenCV is extremely poorly documented, extremely poorly documented, so I, I really have no idea, and I really have no idea what I'm doing, so basically this is cargo culting. What's weird is it's like, it's got every single method documented, like it's got all of them. You go look at the APIs and you're like, ah, oh, this is that method but you can't tell what the method actually does. You don't know what it means. So anyway, like, if you want to learn OpenCV, you start Googling around, and you get some examples from, from people, and like, I, I took some examples from some people and put some code in here, and I, I'm looking at the code, and I'm trying to figure out what it does. Like, what does this mean? Um, so if you look at some of my code in my repo, that's the repo there on GitHub, uh, if you look at it, like, I tried to track down the actual origin of this particular bit of code, and it came from this guy, and he got it from this guy, and he got it from this guy, and he got it from this guy, and this guy, like, doesn't explain it at all. It's like, just, I have no idea. Anyway, so I'm going to discuss the code that's in there and try to get rid of any myths around it or any, like, crazy stuff. 
So basically, the problem that I'm trying to solve is I have, so let's, let's take a look at what we have. What we have is a photo. So this is the photo I take with my webcam. It looks like this, and there's like, it's kind of washed out, but you'll see like this, this card is just in the middle of the screen. It's just there, right? And what we want is, what we want is we need to have a nicely cropped card like this that's rectangular. You'll notice in the previous image it was not rectangular, and we need it that way so we can compare it against the corpus. So we can compare it against those two and see how, against that original image and see how similar it is. So we take a photo, and I'm going to hand wave over this. Somehow you got a photo on your machine. That happened. We have a photo, and we need to pre-process it. And the first thing you do for pre-processing with OpenCV is change it to grayscale. Now we use grayscale. The grayscale output looks like this. It is now gray. Amazing. It's that hard. And then we need to do edge detection on this. So we need to detect all the edges. And OpenCV ships with uh, an algorithm called the Canny Edge Detector, which is an algorithm for detecting edges in an image. And I have no idea how it works. You should go read the Wikipedia page, which is what I did. I still didn't understand it. Anyway, you just say, give me the canny edges, find all the edges, and here's the output for it. It's kind of hard to see, but you'll see those little white lines in there. Those are the edges in the cards. That's the edges. So the next thing I need to do is I need to get all the contours out of this and find things that are not holes. You may be asking, well, Aaron, what is a hole? So this, what this does is it, it loops over all the contours and says, like, OK, skip it if it's a, unless it's a hole, like, you know, put it on there. Skip all the things that are not holes. And you're like, Aaron, what is a hole? I'll show you what a hole is. So on the outside here, we have a contour. And on the inside, we have a hole, what OpenCV considers to be a hole. So a hole is something that is a hole in your outer contour for lack of a better explanation. So that little, that box there around the text is considered a hole around that outer contour. So I only want the outer contours. And this is what OpenCV thinks is all the contours on the image. So the next thing I need to do is like, well, I want the largest contour there. So I say, OK, just give me the max one. You can ask a contour for its area, get the area of the contour, just give me the biggest one, and then it's probably hard to see here, but you'll see like the biggest contour is that line that's around the card. So now that I have this contour, this contour is just an object that represents that singular contour around the card. That's all it represents. But what I need is I need to get a polygon out of this so that I can cut the polygon out of the image. So I say, OK, OpenCV, tell me what the, tell me what the polygon is here. And this is a, give me a polygon for this particular contour. And what's extremely exciting is um, you say, like, OK, give me a polygon, give me a convex hole for that. And if you go look at the C code for this, it has a flag that says, like, OK, I want these points to be in clockwise order. So you get a list of points back, and the points are supposed to be ordered clockwise. The exciting, very extremely exciting thing about this code is that it gives them to you in counterclockwise order. <laughs> which is why I had to reverse them, because <laughs> it was the wrong direction. I don't know. I seriously don't know why. There's literally a constant that's like, OK, clockwise. And it's not clockwise. <laughs> anyway, so I get, the, I get the points in clockwise order. And if you get, look at it, plot it here, like we get right there, the four corners of the card. That's exactly what we want. So the next problem we have to solve with this is that this is not, this is not rectangular. It's just some weird, I guess, trapezoid type image. We need a rectangular shape out of it. So what we say is we say, hey, OpenCV, uh, give me a warp matrix. And what this is is I say, like, OK, I, I want a particular rectangle. I want these particular dimensions. Give me a matrix for warping the image such that it will end up with these particular dimensions. So we, this, is the, this is the code to do that. Uh, gives us a warp matrix. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so then we, we warp the image with that matrix. And then we end up with this. So the image looks totally weird, but you can see up there in the upper left-hand corner, we have the image placed at 0, 0, and it is now rectangular. And we can say, OK, uh, I need a return on investment. That may, actually, <laughs> that may actually stand for region of interest. Um, <laughs> and I, I care about that upper left-hand corner. And then we finally get the image out of there. So now we can actually do card matching with this. We get that, we've got that image, we can actually match cards now. So we look up, we get the Hamming distance for this, feed the Hamming distance into the database. 
sort everything, and then we can save, like once we find a match, we can save the card, and again, I'm gonna completely hand wave over saving the card, because I only have five minutes left, so. Uh, anyway, so this is, what, this is what it looks like in the outcome here. It's like, okay, great, it'll find the card. We save the card, and you'll see, you can see in this example, it becomes part of the corpus after we save it. So as soon as I saved it, now we have two of those cards there. Right? So as soon as you save it, it becomes part of the corpus, and it gets smarter about finding these. Now, after this, I'm able to answer the questions now. Now I can finally answer the questions, you know, what do I have with this query? I know exactly the cards I have. And I can also say, like, how good are they? I can order by rating, and I know, like, well, okay, this is my best card, um, and this is my worst card. And for those of you that play Magic, this card is really... <laughs> Super terrible. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, uh, how much, as for how much they're worth, um, I, can't, I still can't tell you that because uh, I haven't integrated with any pricing systems yet. Like I've been looking into that. I don't, I don't have that yet. Uh, some of the challenges, like I want to talk about some of the challenges with a system like this. Is one of the challenges is time to focus. So this webcam takes forever to focus. If you look at um, when I set a card down over here, if we look at the live feed you'll see like I set the card down and it's like, okay, focus, focus, focus. Ah, there we go, now I can identify it. And when you have 6,000 cards to identify, <laughs> that like second or whatever that it takes there is, it seems like a millennium. The next thing we have, the next problem we have is total failure. So like I'll put a card in and the system's like, I have no idea what that is. And you'll see those three cards on the left there, it's always changing, it has no idea what it is. It can't identify it. And in that case, I actually have to teach the system manually. I have to be like, okay, hey system, this card is actually one of these images. The good news, though, is that after I teach it the first time, the next time it gets it right. So it gets smarter. The, the next problem is similar artwork. So <laughs> these are all different cards. They're all, so they're all the same card, they're just from different sets, right? But they're extremely similar. So my system's like, ah, they look, they look exactly the same. I'm not sure which one this is, and I have to tell it the right one. Uh, the other problem is the cat keeps moving stuff around. It's kind of annoying, he plays with that. <laughs> anyway, so this is the stuff that I've been working on. Uh, hopefully you can use some of this stuff, maybe the promises, I have no idea. Anyway, thank you very much. Um... Uh... is